where best friends and next door neighbors, Willow and Lillian, spill the tea on murder, mysteries, and other things that go bump in the night. So get your favorite teacup ready and let's get into it. Welcome to Cruelty Podcast. This is Lillian, and with me is Willow. Hello. And I sound chipper, but she's I'm not. just... In, she's being sarcastic. I'm insane and furious yeah. and yeah. sad the and scared. Is, is, mm. I can't look at the news mm-hmm. anymore, but like I have to look at the news. Yeah. I feel like I have to be aware of what's going I on. And so it's just constant. Like I open the news and I'm already like kind of yeah. got diarrhea and I'm sweaty. We have a lot of listeners from other countries. And so if you don't know... The United States is a terrible place to live right now. It's very frightening, especially if you're in the South. They're passing a bunch of anti-trans legislation and... um, Even, like, mm. anti... Tennessee just introduced a bill that would abolish interracial marriage and same sex marriage. Good job, Tennessee. What year is it? I just keep asking. Where are we? Where am I? I'm in hell. This is hell. It has to be hell. I used to think we were in purgatory. No, Um, purgatory would be much more mild and boring. This is hell. Yeah. Big stinky hell vibes. Yeah, we're in the bad place. This is the bad place. This is the bad place. But anyway... So, so I'm pretty a bad you, place. Um, a case that's so terrible that, like, I really struggled to do my notes on it. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it, especially from the title. I'm not. I know you're not. Yeah. I don't know how you're not, but you're I not. Don't know. Um, there's a big documentary on Hulu about it, which is, I hesitate to say good or even very thorough. I felt like it kind of glossed over some stuff and focused on weird parts. Oh, so. I don't have Hulu. I got it. I got a Black Friday deal Mm. on Hulu where I get it for $2 a month for a year. Oh. And even my poor ass can afford that. And I can write it off on my taxes. Hell yeah. Which I'm scared to do because taxes frighten me because the government's evil. (laughs) Anyway, um, trigger warning on this is going to be child sexual assault and child abuse. And I need you all to take those seriously. And I will be talking a lot about the stigma behind uh, child sexual assault assault and child sexual abuse because it affected this case greatly in a very bad way. So let's get started. This is the story of Steven Stainer. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those cases that is definitely stranger than fiction, like to the point where it almost beggars belief. How can one family experience so much horror and tragedy? This could be a two-parter, or go on for several hours, but in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on one aspect of this complicated story, and that's the aspect that fits our theme, which is held captive. Stephen Gregory Stainer was born April 18th, 1965, and at the time our story begins, he was seven years old and living in Merced, California, with his parents, Delbert and Kay, and his four brothers and sisters, well, his brother and sisters. He was the third of five children. They lived in a middle-class neighborhood, and from all accounts, they just had kind of a normal, average, suburban life. It was a nice family. I mean, there's some debate on this, and we'll talk about that towards the end. But the source is corrupt, and so I don't... Giant grain of salt. Right. That happens a lot in these cases. You'll see what I mean later. So he had an older brother. He had, like... A younger sister and then an older sister, an older brother named Carrie, who we will talk about at the end of this episode. Stephen and Carrie are the only boys in the five Stainer children, and they were very close growing up. Carrie was four years older than Stephen. So at the time of this story, he will be 11 years old. Carrie. Mm -hmm. Stephen is seven. Life would change for the Stainer family forever on December 4th, 1972. After school, on that December day, Stephen was walking home from school, as he usually did. Now, Willow mentioned in her last episode about J.C. Dugard that most kids kidnapped by strangers are either going to or from school yeah. when they're taken. And it's, a, it's just a vulnerable time. And I'm not saying that to fearmonger by any stretch. Again, the numbers on stranger abduction, they're really rare. It's like less than 1%, right. wasn't it? Um. It's just something to be aware of, like anything else in life, like any risks that we take. And I think equipping our kids with knowledge is super important, but not just stranger danger, more that they need to have kind of a spatial and situational awareness. Right. 
if that makes sense like that's how i am i yeah. saw i saw one surveillance video well a few surveillance videos of women getting abducted in parking lots outside of the grocery yes. store so now i'm just like on high alert of my well, spin sides. around in a whole yeah, ass circle yeah i'm always aware not that that's ever gonna save my ass if something bad happens yeah, but small. you know what i mean i'm so kidnappable i am um, very i'm nearly six feet tall I'm and i weigh over 200 I, pounds I used to be so um, I'm a chunky lass and I am quite tall and I am so loud. And listen, I'll, I've eaten part nobody, of a guy once. Nobody will get that Lillian. No. Uh, it was briefly tried when I was 17. God, that's terrifying. And I put, um, he grabbed me around the waist and I was much skinnier back then because I had an eating disorder. And I it was kicked. also before your car accident. Yes. And I kicked the shit out of him, his car. I took his keys. I jabbed him with his keys. I screamed. And he was just like, God, go away. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you ain't getting me to a secondary location. I have to kill me right here <laughs> yep. right in front of all these folks we're getting over with mm -hmm. <laughs> but my point in saying that is when like if you have neurodivergent kids like i do all three of mine are right. either on the spectrum or have adhd you have to teach them about spatial awareness like mm -hmm. know where you're at look around get your head out your butt God, removing... take the earphones out yeah know where you are yeah now all my kids are pretty much grown now and so this isn't really a worry for me mm -hmm. and they're they don't god they're most boring people they don't go anywhere so <laughs> i'm not too worried about them but i was when they were small and they walked to their bus stop even right. though i could see them and i did stand in the driveway but hey it happened right? to jc dugard right. so the point is we're not shaming the kids or the parents that's stinky poo poo behavior and we're not going to do yeah. it on this podcast and if i hear comments doing it i won't be nice to you okay mm -hmm. Most days, Stephen walked home with his older brother, Carrie, but not on this day. In my research, I couldn't find why Carrie didn't walk home with him, but I'll assume it was likely that Carrie, being older, had extracurricular shit going on that day. Right. Now, I want to say this, because I'm on Reddit a lot, because I love Reddit. Me too. It's stinky yeah. in there, but I love it. Shout out to the people that shout us out on Reddit. Oh my God, you we guys. We don't interact I on Reddit. I so appreciate that. No, I say nothing. You. I'm too afraid. Yes. I just gather information. I just thank you. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Because right. um, we've had several shout outs. Yeah, and it, it like made my heart jump and my stomach fall into my butt. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Hi, thanks. So oh, that's yes. a big compliment. Much yes. obliged yep. to be more Southern than I already am. Um, a lot of people want to say that Carrie intentionally set Stephen up to get kidnapped. And I want to say that theory is pretty much the dumbest shit I've ever heard in my entire life. And yeah. we're not going to. We're not going to go with that yeah. here. It's why he was 11. No, he didn't. That's stupid. Oh, I forgot that you said that. He's I was 11 picturing years a teenager. Old. No. 11. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Stephen was walking alone that day. Now, that doesn't seem to be something too out of the ordinary. Honestly, he had walked home alone before and it wasn't a long walk home. We're talking like two blocks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And remember, this was 1972. Kidnappings yeah. are quite rare, rare, at least from a media standpoint, meaning there's yeah, not and, a ton of coverage. And all kids walked places. All of them. All Everywhere. Kids did. Yes. They went to the store for yes. their mom and dad. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. If, if you weren't like pretty much self-sufficient and independent by a certain age, it's... You it was had, weird. Yeah. You had to be outside until the lights turned on. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And like, I know this was weird and a weird attitude to have to like coddle your children. They called it coddling. Yeah. Because my dad was coddled. Yeah. His mother brought his silverware to every restaurant they went to. Oh, that's a little extra. He, oh, no, it gets worse. He was not allowed out of the yard. Uh. She saved his umbilical cord, which oh. you, you do you, but I, I found it in a photo album. I'm like, what's this crusty turd? <laughs> you know, as a child, she's I, like, oh, that's your sweet daddy's umbilical cord. And I just went, oh, Lord, love a duck. <laughs> God. Kate found Mateos in the backseat of the car. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. All right, hold on. I forgot it was there. <laughs> I have questions. I want no answers. So I'm in a. I'm moving on. It's, it's fine. Oh, I felt my <laughs> gorge rise. I'm gonna throw up. Anyway, I'm judging the I'm shit out of you. Literally just here. 
in life to say weird things to you. That's well, all I do. <laughs> oh, my sensibilities. You should see it when we're not on the on the on the microphones. It's it's no it's, different. It's just constant. It doesn't. I'm end. just like Willa. Why? <laughs> why? I'll shake you? I don't understand. I don't either. No, um, nobody does. Yeah, pit, like I said, children went to the store by themselves. Right. They they went to like the little you know five and dime and they oh, would get the little comic books. Yeah, absolutely. Except my dad, who's never allowed to go anywhere, and he's <laughs> weird, y'all. He's a weird and neurotic man. So you didn't see things like stranger danger being discussed until the no. late seventies, early eighties, when rashes of kidnappings were happening all over the yeah, United States. Yeah, and it was mostly the eighties. Yes, it mm-hmm. was. At this time, kids are taught to respect and mm-hmm. obey all adults. A thousand percent. Yes. Yes. So on his walk home, Stephen was approached by an older man named Irvin Murphy. Irvin was holding some religious pamphlets pamphlets and asked Stephen if his mother had anything to donate to the church. And Stephen said his mother probably would donate things. Mm -hmm. And Irvin asked Stephen if he could come to his house and speak to his mother. And Stephen saw no seven. He was like, yeah, sure. Right. Of course he did. He was, it was a church going man. You're taught like people related to the church are so good and you can trust them. And no offense to anyone, but Google youth pastor sex assault and then get back to me on that. So Stephen felt safe. Yeah. Urban then offered Stephen a ride home. And at first Stephen declined because his house was less than two blocks away. He's like, why don't we just walk? But Irvin insisted. And remember, this is a a little baby. This is Mm -hmm. a baby boy. Seven years old. And I don't know what I would have done had an adult insisted like that. But Stephen is already scared. Yeah, I would have honestly at that age, I would have just gotten in that car because an adult is telling me to do something. I just don't know because I was weird and kind of um, unruly in general. Um, And I'd already experienced some abuse at the hands of adults. So I did not trust them. Mm. But I don't know what I would have done. Uh, But Stephen finally caved in to the pressure. Right after Stephen agreed, an older model white Buick pulled up beside Stephen and Irvin. The driver was 41-year-old convicted child rapist Kenneth Parnell. Okay. Now, I want to... This is scary now. I want... This whole thing is terrifying. I'm going to give a little backstory on Kenneth Parnell and Irvin Murphy. So, Irvin Murphy and Kenneth Parnell... um, They weren't friends. That's not really the relationship I would use. Irvin Murphy was a man who was described as simple and naive. He likely had some developmental disabilities. He worked with Kenneth at a resort in Yosemite National Park. Mm. Kenneth told Irvin that he was an aspiring youth minister. Of course he did. And over a some period of time and I can never like my research didn't tell me how long like he knew Irvin I don't think very long but Irvin just would believe anything you told him Mm. he wasn't this is not a bad man this is a no he does not like a a sheep led to the slaughter type thing yes he was manipulated lied to and it was like when he he listened to interviews of Irvin, he does not know what's going on. Oh no! He, he said that Kenneth told him he wanted to f- kidnap a boy because he wanted to raise a child in the right way in a quote religious type deal. He just didn't understand. And Kenneth repeatedly uses his power over other people throughout his entire life. Right. And I'm not saying that what Irvin didn't do was wrong. It was right. I'm saying he was of diminished capacity and I don't boy. Mm. I just don't even think he should have been charged. I think he's another victim. He is definitely Stephen agreed later Mm -hmm. that Irvin was just another victim of Kenneth. Yeah. Kenneth Parnell had a tumultuous childhood. His father walked out on the family when he was young. And as a result, he was kind of just a badly behaved child. He spent the majority of his teen years in juvenile hall for a variety of petty crimes. He was also in and out of mental hospitals throughout his early years. My research didn't reveal what psychiatric conditions he had, and I'm not going to play psychiatrist because I'm an idiot. He was troubled. Mm -hmm. And I think he had a lot of depression and anxiety because he's a pedophile. It is believed that he was molested at a boarding house type situation when he was 13 in Bakersfield, California. The boarding house was run by his mother. Kenneth, though, vehemently denies that he was ever assaulted or molested. And I can't substantiate that with enough 
evidence or sources. So right. I'm just going to say it was a rumor. I mean, it would make sense. He has abandonment, abuse, and mental health issues. It made for a dangerous combination in Kenneth. But I want to point something out really super important, because I think this is a misunderstanding a lot of people had. Just because you were molested mm. doesn't mean you will go on to molest people. Mm -hmm. It can. Sometimes the cycles of abuse right. continue. But being molested as a child isn't going to turn you into a pedophile. Exhibit A and B. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And we'll talk about that a little more later. I think it's just really hard for people to understand when a perpetrator does these sexual crimes without having them done to them. You know what I mean? When it's the opposite. Well, here's what I think. And this is, I don't like this take, but it's yeah. the only conclusion I've come to. I think people are born that way. Something's wrong upstairs. Yeah. I consider it a mental illness. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I don't, there's been no effective ways to treat pedophilia. Yeah. Um, Ugh, I do not, let's be clear, consider it a fucking sexuality. It is a disorder. Ew. Oh, Ew. yeah, there are people pushing. I don't, I don't even want to. It often gets lumped into the LGBTQIA no, pedophiles trying to lump allowed. themselves in there, but they're not nope, allowed. Nobody not allowed. wants them here. Get the no. fuck out. We'll no. take furries, but we ain't taking your ass. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love y'all furries, but you scare me sometimes. My I God. don't understand. But you know what? Is it hurting anybody? <laughs> nope. I don't care. Dress like a cartoon dog. I don't give a shit. Because <laughs> live and let live, which we all need to l really learn how to fucking do. Right. In 1951, Kenneth was arrested for kidnapping and sexually assaulting a young boy. I don't have any further information on that, like the age or the name of the boy. How old was he? Uh, he would have been about 20, like 21. Okay. okay. He also had charges stemming from impersonating a sheriff because in order to kidnap the boy, he showed him a fake sheriff's badge. Yeah. Gross. Yeah. Disgusting. And he should have never been let out of prison. He only spent four years in prison. Why do they not take sexual crimes seriously? Why? Why? Because I don't okay. understand. Let's break it down for y'all just for a second, because I asked this. I used to ask really this don't. question, but now I do. I get it. So the lawmakers. Yeah. People in power. Yeah are often sexual offenders themselves. Oh, they don't I forgot care. about that part. They don't care about women, and they don't yeah. care about children. They'll scream all day about, yeah. save the fetus. But once that fetus is an infant out yeah. of its mother's body, they don't care. So what is it really about? The control and of women. repression yeah. of women. Or, so, yeah. Because if they did care, Anatomy. if they did actually care about children, right. get this through your heads, y'all. If they cared about children and women, then they would make laws to protect children and women. Right. And they wouldn't be going after drag queens mm -hmm. because that's some dumb shit. Yeah. That's the dumbest shit I've ever heard really in my is. fucking life. I'm just like, I'm appalled. I'm beyond appalled. I am just flabbergasted yeah. Yeah. because it, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to go after child predators, which we should all do. I think we can all agree that pedophiles mm. suck. Yeah. But if you are one of those that got roped into the hashtag save the children rabbit hole of weirdness to where you think Wayfair is like smuggling children in cabinets, I'm not mad at you. Shit's convincing. I believed it for the <clears throat> first hour or two because I, know I you was did. pregnant and hormonal. Yeah, we all, children are a weakness, especially mamas. Yeah. But y'all, that is rhetoric used by hateful right wing groups right. to get you to hate trans and gay people. That listen, our government is not run by lizards. That's silly. Mm -hmm. We can agree that's silly. And you know, I love cryptids and shit. Mm -hmm. The government's run by corrupt, greedy, evil men. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's as plain. They don't need to be lizards. In fact, lizards might do a better job at this point. Yeah. I'll vote for the lizard. Where is it? Mm -hmm. Come on, lizard man. You have my vote. Mm hmm. Dude, lizards don't use money, I don't think. They don't give a shit about money, lizards. Yeah. They like crickets. Oh, we'll see. So we we'll just feed the president crickets and he'll just, eh, he'll like stamp things with his lizard hand. Yeah. There's not, right, they're not huge satanic cabals drinking baby blood, but there are a bunch of rich old white dudes molesting kids. Yes. And that's who we need to and tear we them apart. And that. We have it. It's right there. Just Google it, y'all. Yeah. Drag queens are not assaulting children. No. They're just trying to read them Did stories. Did you notice that we have had so many perpetrators on this podcast? 
that fit the generic white dude white dude bill yeah. we have not had a single drag queen Mm-mm. that has killed or touched the and children. let's be clear i'm sure if you dig hard enough I'm you sure will find there. one but they're not we haven't we haven't covered one not I'm, yet i'm not gonna look because i don't care to but i just promise I'm just you saying. i'm just you get research for yourself it's very few and Girl. far between they're not like there's not roaming bands of child molesting drag queens out there. That's very silly. Quite the opposite. The drag queens are actually on foot saving children, getting hungry children off the street, promoting them, literacy. Them, and yeah, yeah. You know what? When them. I was homeless, who housed me? Yeah. Drag queens. Exactly. They housed yeah. me and fed me and gave me a bed mm-hmm. and a job. Mm-hmm. So I just don't want to fucking hear it. <laughs> back, to, back to the case. There's going to be a lot of side stakes. I'm mad. Yeah, so just, in later interviews after his arrest for the kidnapping of Stephen Stainer, Kenneth would explain his reasoning for kidnapping and sexually assaulting the unnamed young boy when he was 21. Mm-hmm. He said he was married at the time and his wife was pregnant. He had to find another outlet implying he had to rape this child because his wife couldn't or wouldn't have sex with him while she was pregnant. What a fucked up, disgusting excuse. And I especially like how he blames it on a woman because he's a great guy. It's fucking disgusting. Kenneth is said to have been married three times. However, there are only records of two marriages. I'm thinking the last one might have been a common law situation. He had two children from his first two marriages and had absolutely nothing to do with them. They were daughters. Thank God. Oh, Yeah, he wasn't interested in them because they were girls. Ten years after his kidnapping and rape conviction, Kenneth went back to prison for armed robbery. He spent a few years in prison for that, and that takes us to the time he was working at the Yosemite National Park Resort. Mm -hmm. He was a night auditor, which meant he would check in late night guests and man the front desk after hours. This is where he met Irvin Murphy and twisted and convinced him to help him with his kidnapping. So back to the main story. So Stephen gets into the car with Irvin and Kenneth right away. They drive past Betty Road, and that is the road to Stephen's house. He points this out to Kenneth, and Kenneth tells Stephen not to worry, that he'll call Stephen's parents and get the okay for Stephen to spend the night. And Stephen is very afraid and confused. He didn't ask to or want to spend the night with this strange old man. Oh, my stomach just dropped. I mean, 41 isn't old. (laughs) I'm 43, but still. A strange older man to, to a seven, seven year old. old. Yeah, you think 40s like 40s 800 old. years old. Yeah, yep. mm-hmm. just practically Esther the fucking mummy at that point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he doesn't understand what's going on. After taking Stevens, after leaving Stevens' hometown of Merced, Kenneth stops at a payphone. Now, y'all, if you are young, you're like, I, I know. don't know what oh, the fiddly what? fuck that is, and then it makes me feel 85. Yeah, go practice on a rotary phone for a second and just kind of feel. They don't know what, what that is like. either, honey. So a payphone. This is in the years before cell phones. Obviously, they have a little booth, and it's a box, and it's got a you know the old timey phone handle. You put in a quarter. They they know. No, they may not. There are some towns that have removed all of them. Really? Yes. Okay, go on. Sorry, I'm just I'm in shock still. Yeah. Shush, shush, shush. Okay. You put in a quarter. Yeah. And you, I, I think at the time it would have been a dime too. So oh. like that's how far back we going because oh. this is like even and the cords are metal. That was always fun to they play. They are. Like, and you go squeak mm-hmm. squeak because mm-hmm. they're dirty. People yeah. fuck in there. We didn't think about germs back then though. No, we didn't give a fuck. No. Um, yeah. And so he uses the payphone. Except he's pretending to make a phone call. He says this in confession later. Stephen doesn't know this. So when he gets back in the car, he tells seven-year-old Stephen that he spoke to his parents and that his parents no longer want him. They don't want to see him again, and they don't want them want him as their son. Baby. And I just think that's the worst thing Baby. he did to that child. When Stephen didn't arrive home from school, his parents immediately contacted police. It wasn't like Stephen not to come straight home. Because of his age, nobody thought he ran away. So a massive search of law enforcement and volunteers started pretty much immediately. Good. Like he hadn't even been missing 30 minutes. Good. Unfortunately, literally nothing came from it. There were no witnesses to the kidnapping and no evidence left behind. It brought no leads. And y'all, this is how this happens, okay? This is how when you hear vanished off the face of the earth, this is what this means. Mm -hmm. That these predators wait until you're alone and don't leave a trace. Yeah. They have planned this out. Yeah. They've either stalked you ahead of time or in Stephen's case, just waiting for any random child to walk by by themselves. Right. 
but no one literally disappears. There's always an answer. I just want to point that out. Mm -hmm. Stephen's disappearance and the uncertainty of his fate was a huge hardship on the Stainer family. Dilbert, Stephen's dad, was by all reports a broken man. Stephen's mother went cold and withdrawn, especially as more time passed, even from her other children. It was hard on Carrie, too, Stephen's brother, who was 11. He often blamed himself. Where before he got a lot of attention from his parents, being the oldest son, all anyone talked about now was poor missing Stephen. This would have a devastating and horrific outcome for Carrie later on. Hmm. Carrie was 11 when seven-year-old Stephen went missing. Carrie would later go on to say that he felt neglected by his parents after his brother's kidnapping. Friends of Carrie would say that Carrie felt guilty for not walking home that day with Stephen. So naturally, this takes just a horrible toll. Carrie once went outside on a clear night to wish on a star for his little brother to come home. He said he did that every night that he could, and he never told anyone until years later. Thanks. And I think that's just... Because he took so much responsibility for it. So when I hear so theories it... that he state helped get his brother kidnapped, so stupid. Oh. <clears throat> but we'll get to that. It's just so precious that he thinks that the thing that's going to help is a, is a wish on a star. He's just an innocent child, that's too. so precious. Is, at the time. It doesn't stay that way, but we'll get to that. Oh, God. This story's terrible, and I'm sorry in advance. Kenneth drove Stephen to a cabin in Kathy's Valley, which is in Mariposa County, California. Stephen didn't know this, and this is so heartbreaking, but this cabin was only several hundred feet from Stephen's maternal grandmother's home. Mm. Weird coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. This case has so many weird things like this. Can you imagine, in hindsight, how devastating that would be? Knowing Looking back and knowing that, like, while you're at, you could have just walked over there. You're sitting there cooking dinner, and he's right there. He's right there. Yeah. Kenneth, by this time, has convinced little Stephen that his parents no longer want him, and that he, Kenneth, will be his father now. Stephen is confused and very sad and scared, but he believes him because why wouldn't he? He's only seven. Kenneth even told Stephen that a judge had given him permission to adopt him which is all lies, of course, but to a child that sounds very official. Right. So he has no, he kind of resigns himself. Well, and he's a pastor. So it would make sense that a child would be given to. Well, a he didn't, he wasn't told that. That's oh, only what Irvin no, was told. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. That night, Kenneth molests Stephen. Keeps Stephen in his room where he is not allowed to leave for two weeks. Every night, Stephen is molested. Stephen begs to go home, but Kenneth refuses. Kenneth actually gets annoyed by Stephen's sadness and homesickness. He wants the child to forget his past with his family. In order to make him forget, Kenneth drugs Stephen every night and during the day with cough syrup. He just keeps him loopy and sleepy. Kenneth tells Stephen his name is no longer Stephen, but Dennis Parnell. He isn't allowed to call himself Stephen Stainer anymore. He is trying to erase this little boy's identity. I don't know why I find that to be one of the more egregious things, but it is to me. You take everything from someone, their innocence, you take away their family, you take away their life, and then you take away their name and they can't even be who they are. It's It's disgusting and terrifying. It solidifies and kind of wraps the entire brainwashing up in a brand new package. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah, I I fucking Mm -hmm. hate it. After two weeks in captivity, Kenneth rapes Stephen. This was, of course, the entire reason he kidnapped him. He wasn't an inspiring minister. He had no intention or care about religion or religious education for Stephen. It is hell for the little boy, physically and emotionally. Kenneth, after those first two weeks, moves Stephen from place to place around California throughout the years. Kenneth can never keep a job for very long, and once he'd lose a job, they'd move again. They stayed in old trailers, hotels, boarding houses, that sort of thing. Kenneth didn't want to stay in one place too long, likely so no one would recognize Stephen because this kidnapping actually had kind of widespread nationwide media attention. But I mean, not for very long. These things fizzle out. If they don't find the kid within a couple weeks, nobody cares anymore. Yeah. Eventually, excuse me, eventually Kenneth even enrolled Stephen in school. That's ballsy. I want to ask the fuck is wrong with these schools not asking for paperwork. Mm. They didn't. They just took Kenneth's word for Mm -hmm. it and just put him in school. I just, if they had, if they had just asked, if they had just looked into it, they didn't find it suspicious. I just, it blows my mind. Our school system at work. (laughs) Yeah. 
so I homeschool my my uh, youngest. Mm-hmm. Um, my other two are done with school mm-hmm. and in college, and uh, no one asks me what, to no. see the curriculum. No. I could be teaching them beep beep boop boop peep. Oh no, you literally can. I've seen I've seen people give their kids coloring books for homeschool. And they don't it. check. They don't no. care. Mm-mm. What the fuck. Mm-hmm. I don't do that, by the way. He's learning uh, Python, Rust, and right now we're focusing on sociology. Because, you know, right. got to learn. As one does, poor Stephen adjusted to his new life. He did okay in school. And then Kenneth got him a dog named Queenie. It was a little terrier-type dog. <laughs> and Stephen credits the dog for his ability to survive because he relied on that dog for emotional support. And I find it interesting. These captors will give the children pets. Unlike in the JC Dugard story, uh, Stephen got to keep Queenie. Oh, good. It really did help. I got, I got sad instantly because I was like, Oh, Queenie. I know. It's so cute. (gasps) That's, that'd be such a good dachshund name. It would be. Queenie the weenie. Queenie the weenie. I do. I got to get a dachshund now. <laughs> yes, what the please. fuck? Bunny would love a new so friend. Just did a Seth Rogen laugh. Look, this is how we sell it to Maris. Queenie, Queenie the weenie is very funny and yes. Bunny could use a friend. Ooh. They could play and wear costumes. And, and they, you could get a teacup one. A teeny weenie. Queenie. Queenie the teeny weenie. Well, I love that. I'm sold, frankly. <laughs> Gather yourself. Oh, no. I don't <laughs> like it. At this point, it's likely that Kenneth now believes he has brainwashed Stephen. That Stephen thinks his name is Dennis. That he doesn't remember his old life at all. But Stephen never forgot. Really? Despite never. Oh, good. Man, this kid had an amazing oh, memory. Oh, God. That's it, why. I was so yeah. scared for him because, I mean, it really is easy. I've been brainwashed before. It's uh-huh. really easy. And, you know, with J.C. Well, Dugard. Yo, I forgot whole years of my life. Yeah. Trauma's yeah. a bitch. Yeah. I think it's called dissociative amnesia. Yes, that's yes. what it's called. Mm-hmm. And I have it. Yeah, me too. But Stephen didn't. And he just, just so he proud. kind of like remembered on purpose. Like this is part of his survival. It's so, cr- it's, that's such an extra fight for your brain to do because your brain is programmed to wipe out any memories that cause distress. Mm-hmm. So the fact that he did that, like he bypassed his brain's programming. That's incredible. I am. The strength of this child is, uh, I'm going to cry. Unfathomable. Oh, I'm going to, I'm just choking it back. This whole episode, this whole story is so tragic and heartbreaking that I can't, I wish I could give you a good ending and I can't. God damn it. I know. When Steven was nine, two years after his abduction, Kenneth moved a woman named Barbara Matthias into the house. This is like, though we don't know cause it's never stated explicitly. This was likely a romantic Okay. relationship she's been called his mistress before barbara along with kenneth raped stephen nine times he, yes he counted she was with them for 18 months before leaving and it makes me sick this woman was a mother that's fucking disgusting in 1975 kenneth convinces barbara to help him abduct another young boy he was a little boy in the Santa Rosa's boys club and acquaintance of Steven. So they were trying to use his own friends, which I think is disgusting. She tried to lure the boy to a place where Kenneth could grab him. And this attempt was not successful. Thank God. Barbara Matthias had a 12 year old son named Lloyd who played with Steven. Barbara would maintain that she had no idea Steven was kidnapped or that any sexual abuse was going on. And I call 100% bullshit on that. She was involved. I believe Stephen, whose memories of the events were pretty remarkable considering all the abuse and trauma. He's not going to lie about it because, right. you know, he covered for Irvin. He said yeah. Irvin was a victim like he was. Yeah. But not this bitch. Right. Oof, hell ain't hot enough. Mm-mm. She was never charged with anything. That's disgusting. And I'll explain why. I know why. And it makes me very angry. Barbara was only with Kenneth and Stephen for 18 months, and I can't find a lot of information concerning her stay with them. I don't think she had full custody of her son, Lloyd, so I don't know if he was there the entire time. I don't know if Lloyd was abused by Kenneth, but I think it's likely that he wasn't. Mm. He was too old. Twelve? Mm-hmm. Kenneth liked them little bitty. Oh, my. 
In fact, Stephen was growing too old for him by 1976. In 1976, they moved again, this time to a small town in Mendocino County, California. Here they lived in a trailer in a very secluded area with a low population. This is a theme. They're mm-hmm. always doing that. Mm-hmm. Stephen started going to high school there and was at, well, it says high school, but it was technically middle school. I don't know that they had middle school in the 70s. It's Maybe like elementary did. and then high school. That's it. Yeah. Because I'm in some places, yeah. especially rural areas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it was elementary than high school for mm-hmm. sure. Um Man, and he, we see victim blaming here a lot, and a lot of podcasts I've listened to about this and stuff. How could I've you blame read. him for anything? Because he's going to school, he's got a girlfriend, he's playing sports, he's super popular. Why didn't he tell anyone? That's what they say. Well, for starters, y'all, he believed his parents abandoned him and didn't want him anymore. Yeah. And in addition, Kenneth did this really kind of ingenious thing. I mean, I hate to give him any credit, but he let. Stephen do whatever the fuck he wanted to do. Let him drink, smoke cigarettes, do drugs. Kenneth could, I mean, Stephen could come and go anytime he wanted. Mm -hmm. He had like all this freedom. And of course his peers were like, wow, that's so amazing. Your dad lets you party. Your dad's so cool. Now Stephen deep down knew Kenneth was not his dad, but he let himself believe it. Because this was his coping mechanism. This is why Stockholm Syndrome is a thing. It is so you can fucking cope with these terrible situations. So I don't want to hear anyone victim. Well, and he had told him at a very young age. I adopted you. Yeah. So So call for help. How about what? Right. This is what happened. They're like, you're legally bound to each other by contract. That's right. I'm adopted. I tried to run away. Trust me. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. And what'd they do? They drug you right back. Yeah. So that's just what he thought would happen. He didn't think anything illegal was going on. He's been being raped since he was seven, y'all. He just thinks that how life is. So sad. He hadn't forgotten his old life. He just didn't think that was his life anymore. Mm -hmm. He didn't know his family wanted him. Right. No idea. Stephen did well in school and, like I said, even had a girlfriend. He was frequently left alone while Kenneth went off to work. It didn't occur to him to call for help because, like like I said, he would just say, I didn't know that I could. Right. Yeah. Kenneth became really permissive as Stephen got even older. And it just he just came and went as he pleased. He could kind of have whatever he wanted. It's almost like Kenneth no longer gave a, sh- gave a shit about him. Yeah. Because he, he didn't. Yeah. So why was Kenneth so careless? I have several theories. One, he was losing interest in Stephen sexually. Yeah. He was now in high school. He was too old. Another reason is that he believed Stephen was completely brainwashed. Like he thought he was successful in removing memories of his old life. And that Stephen believed he was his real father. Kenneth didn't think Stephen remembered his life with his family at all. And finally, I think a part of Kenneth just wanted Stephen to run away and leave. Stop being a problem. I'm yeah. done with you. Yeah. Now you're just in my way. Yeah. Ew, I'm not attracted to you anymore. I don't have any use for you. Oh, that's so gross. With the lack of interest from Kenneth, Stephen wasn't being assaulted anymore. And he got to do whatever he wanted. And he was popular in school. And for a while, it made it okay. He was doing okay. Yeah. He felt pretty good about himself. He felt like he was doing okay. And he knew, just like, I'll become a legal adult and then I could do whatever I want. Right. Yeah. But all of that was about to change. Good. In 1979, Stephen is 14 years old and has been held captive for seven years. Kenneth and Stephen move yet again. They move to another town 14 miles away in, in a town called Manchester. Not England, this is California. This was a remote cabin without m- any people around, really, not really any neighbors. And you notice when Kenneth picks a cabin for when he's ready to kidnap another boy. With Kenneth's waning interest and fear that Stephen was getting too big to physically control, Kenneth decided it was time to abduct another young boy, and he wanted Stephen to help him. So Stephen pretended to go along with it, and they would go cruising for little boys, and he would tell Stephen, now get out and bring him back to the car, but Stephen would whisper to them, run, go. Jesus Christ. He sabotaged it. Because he didn't want any other little boy to suffer what he had suffered. No. No. Kenneth doesn't know that he's sabotaging it, though. Stephen's pretty sly about it. And I mean, I got to hand it to him. Like, how clever and how smart. Right. 
Uh, Kenneth just simply believes that Stephen makes a terrible accomplice. He's just not good at this. Just fucking hate this guy so much. So instead, he coerces a friend of Stephen's named Randall Sean Poorman. Now, I tried to find out how old Randall was at the time of this. I'm going to guess he's about 15, 16. And he says, if you help me kidnap a little boy, I will give you drugs and money. And at first, Randall agrees. And he gives him some drugs. And then Randall's like, you know what? I don't want to do this. I, I don't want to. I don't like this. I don't want to do it. And Kenneth threatens him, threatens to blackmail him, threatens to go to the police and tell him that he is drugs. And so Randall agrees because he doesn't feel like he has any choice. So on February 14th, 1980, Kenneth and Randall drive to Ukiah in California. I know to find a boy to kidnap. God damn. Kenneth parks his car and instructs Randall to walk up and down the street until he finds a young boy. After a while, Randall spots Timothy White, who is five. Oh, honey. Timothy was playing outside his parents' house when Randall approached him and asked him to come with him. Timothy said no and started to go back to his house. Randall then grabbed him and dragged him kicking and screaming into Kenneth's car. They immediately drive back to the cabin. There's a big difference between Timothy and Stephen. Yeah. Timothy just has a lot of fight in him. He just does. You know, you meet people, they have different levels of fight. Yeah. So I think Stephen is more of a, and when fight or flight happens, he's more of a fawn Mm -hmm. or a freeze. Mm -hmm. Timothy was like, fight. That kid just wasn't having it. And just like with Stephen, Kenneth starts brainwashing Timothy. He renames him Tommy and tells him his parents no longer want him and that he's his real father now. Stephen watches all of this in horror, knowing what's in store for Timothy. Kenneth tells Timothy that Stephen is now his older brother and also dyes Timothy's light blonde hair a darker color. After two weeks in captivity, it is clear that Timothy is really struggling emotionally. And it's not to say that Stephen didn't, but I think there's the age difference. I think being seven, he had a little more on the ball. Stephen's a very introspective person. Mm -hmm. And he clearly is just thinking through everything very logically. Timothy's just, he's a baby and he's not coping. He wants his mama. Yeah. He wants his mama and he wants to go home. And he is always crying. He is very depressed. And Kenneth isn't a warmer parental figure, obviously. Stephen felt very sorry for Timothy and started looking after him, trying to comfort him. And in the short time, the two became very close. Stephen felt brotherly love towards him and wanted to protect him. Stephen didn't want Timothy to suffer like he had. So he decided he was just going to take Timothy home. Sorry, it really chokes me up because it's so scary. He's 14. Remember when you were 14? I had no courage. I was just a dumb kid. Oh, I was a, I was practically an adult at 14. It was. Well, when I say had no courage, like I was smoking cigarettes behind the high school and I was smoking right. weed and I was being a delinquent. Right. I wasn't a hero. No, no. I did things to protect my ass, not risk yeah. my ass. You know what I'm saying? I was always covering my ass. Yeah. I didn't, wouldn't have done anything like this. I don't, I just don't know. I can't imagine right. even being in this situation, but and I will choke up for the rest of this episode. Oh, just not ready. On the night of March 1st, 1980, Stephen decided that that was the night they were going to leave. When Kenneth went to work, Stephen and Timmy left and he didn't really know what to do. So they just started hitchhiking all the way to Ukiah. Oh, baby. And, I mean, they walked a little bit. They got lots of rides. And when they ended up in Ukiah, it was, like, late. It was, like, past midnight. And poor little Timmy, he couldn't really figure out where he lived. Nothing looked familiar. He was all freaked out. And, of course, Stephen is very afraid that Kenneth will just show up. And then they'll be hurt. Yeah. And so it occurs to him, he's like, well, I'm going to go to the police. Yes. And I'm going to see if they have Timmy's address. Yes. And so that's what he does. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. But he was sort of afraid of the police, and I don't blame him. So he just, he wasn't even thinking about himself or going home himself. He just wants to get Timmy home. See, that's the beautiful part of this. It's the selflessness. I I still think he's in the throes 
of Stockholm Syndrome he knew and didn't know at the same time. Yeah. Stephen tells police pretty much everything. And, you know, all about him and all about Timmy. Mm -hmm. He then sits quietly for a moment before uttering the most famous line from this case. This line would later go on to be a book and then a TV movie, which I saw as a kid and it traumatized me. Based on the events of his life, he said, I know my first name is Stephen. Baby. In that one sentence, I think it all came crashing down for him. He never forgot who he was. He hung on to his identity. And in that moment, he reclaimed himself. And I think it is amazing amount mm -hmm. of strength. This case really hurts my feelings. On March 2nd, 1980, Kenneth Parnell was arrested for kidnapping. Oh, good. Motherfucker. <sighs> but don't no. sigh in relief because it don't. God damn you're it. You're going to be so mad here in a minute. Ooh. Ooh. Irvin Murphy and Randall Poorman are also arrested. Now prepare yourselves because this is, I don't have words. I'm just mad. So prosecutors didn't charge Kenneth with the seven years of rape of Stephen or any sexual assault charges on Timmy. And the reasoning was that molested kids are damaged goods. What? And yes, that's a quote from Wikipedia. What? I'll get to it in a second. And the charges would bring further stigma against the boys. Shame. They didn't need the shame. How are they supposed to go about their life? Because people might think they're gay. Excuse me? Yeah. So I got, I need a minute. I need a box and it's made of soap. It's my soap box. I'm going to get on it real quick. I want to tell you this right now. And you listen to me out there. You promise to listen to me. If you are a survivor of child sexual abuse, you are not damaged goods. You aren't. And I know you feel like it sometimes because I do. My mother molested me when I was little and she let a neighbor molest me and it was deeply hurtful and traumatizing and I still struggle today with feelings of self-worth. But deep down, I do know that I am worthy of love and respect. Even if I didn't get it from my abusers, I am worth so much more than how I perform sexually, because you struggle with that. I am worth so much more than what I can do for others. Alone in a vacuum, I am worth more. And so are you. We are not damaged goods. We are whole and beautiful, and we suffered something terrible. And we survived. And then you know what the fuck we did? We broke the cycle of abuse. Yeah. I raised three really beautiful kids. I never laid a hand on them, and they are sweet and good and never knew that sort of horror, and so I am glad. And I wanted to take that as an aside and just talk to y'all about it. It's hard for me to share, obviously. It makes my stomach hurt, yeah. and it makes me feel five years old again and helpless. But we do have to talk about it. Because we have to end the stigma. Y'all, we are victims. We didn't do anything wrong. Yes. I was an innocent They're child. the damaged goods, not us. Yes. But I have had, when I told a partner, oh. I was dumped because I was damaged goods. Yeah. And that really hurt me. Yeah. Obviously, um, I got told because I was in you know, a queer relationship, that it was because I was molested. And that's not why I'm in a queer relationship, because I, I love my husband. Yeah. And he's beautiful. And I want you to know that we are strong and we're amazing and we survived. And even if we don't feel strong, we are. Yeah. Because we're still here. And a lot of the time, I don't feel strong. I feel lost and weak and scared, but we get up and we do this shit every day. And I, y'all, I will have resources linked yeah. uh, in the description. So please check those out if you need additional support. You can always reach out to me too. And I can't do a lot, but I will do what I can. And if any of this resonates with you and you want to send a little love my way for this emotional labor, I would greatly appreciate it. Our coffee account is linked in our link tree. All proceeds help me get me there. Get where you may ask to a place where I can do more than offer a shoulder to cry on. I want do something about it money. It's the reason I want success for this podcast. Not for like, of course, I want to be not poor. That'd be cool. But more than that, I want to help 
people yeah. and not just talk about it. I want to say, here's some money I can throw at this problem. And now every you don't episode, have it anymore. Every episode we could donate like a, go, a good chunk of money and put our money where our mouth is. You well, right know, now. Like, that would just, be so beautiful. All we get right now is enough to run it, which yeah. is fine because I think the message is important. But the broader my audience, the more just, I can do. It hurts our own feelings that we yeah. only are able to talk about things and not actually do things. And you know um, what? I believe in this shit so hard. Right. I believe in this podcast. I know we're going to make it. Right. And I will tell you, the moment I make it is the moment I have do something money and I will do something. Yeah. Mark my words. If I don't tar and feather me, please, I will help. <laughs> <laughs> I sure will. Throw myself in the tar. Oh, right in there mm-hmm. and roll around in the feathers. So back to the case. I just wanted to take a moment to say that, that stigma is so harmful. That line was so triggering. It really was. How many of us have thought those thoughts? Maybe people didn't say anything to us, but the second that I was literally called damaged goods. I've always called myself damaged goods. Luckily, nobody's yeah. called it to my face. But that line has always stuck with me because it's like you you think that something is taken from you. You think sacredness is taken from you. And so you no longer well, you're dirty. Yes. And it's the kind of dirty that you can't scrub off, even though you immediately go to the shower and try to rip your skin off. Yeah, it doesn't do. come off. No. And I wanted to take a moment cause it's really important to talk about. I can't even believe that's on Wikipedia. Yeah. I wrote a mean, a mean email about it. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Well, at least you're doing something. I want you're it blacked out or it. something. I don't want to see that. Yeah. I just wanted to read about this case. Yeah. <laughs> and, it was really <clears throat> triggering just to hear that line. And I will have a... Uh, in the description. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. that line's... Oh, it really hurts. Fucking vile. It really does How dare me. they say that in court? Like, what the fuck? Charge them of their crimes. It's disgusting. So back to the case, and now we can be mad instead of sad. Kenneth, because he wasn't charged with any of the sexual assaults, yeah. was only sentenced to seven years in prison. Seven. He got out in four. Not even as long as he tortured that poor little boy. I'm so fucking mad. He just got out and did it again, didn't he? He did do it again. Yeah, we're mad about it. Fucking stigma put this creep on the streets to reoffend because of course he did. He was a pedophile. In 2003, he was convicted of trying to buy a child. He had a caregiver named Diane and he asked her to buy him a four year old child. And I need this to be a trigger warning because he says something disgusting with, I quote, a clean rectum. This led to his arrest. Thank fuck. He was sentenced to 25 to life and died in prison in 2008. That shit should have never happened. He should have never breathed free air again. I'm just revolted. If this don't make you believe that we need reform of You're our justice system. You're not going to lock system. him up for the actual crimes that he committed. Just the crimes he was thinking about committing? Yeah. What the actual Well, fuck? it was the three strikes rule, which I think is was it's made so... to punish black people, but I'm glad it got this guy at least. So stupid. Stephen would go home to a hero's welcome, and I wish I could tell you that he had a wonderful life after his ordeal but he didn't he struggled to adjust to life back with his family he was 14 now having been gone for seven years the media attention was very intense i mean he was on all the talk shows and everything the whole family was fractured and again stigma played a huge role they didn't want to seek counseling not for steven and not for the family because of the attention of the media and the stigma of the sexual assaults Stephen's father no longer hugged him because of that. The fuck? Yeah. And it just really hurts. At first, they treated him as though he were seven, and Stephen considered himself nearly a grown man. I mean, he rescued a little child and hitchhiked across, like, several counties. Mm. And when they stopped treating him like a little child, they just ignored him and emotionally withdrew made him uncomfortable yeah in 1985 Stephen married jody edmondson and they had two children together and i'm not going to talk about his children i want to keep that private um you can go find it somewhere else <clears throat> that's had enough media attention they yeah. just don't need any more he joined the church of latter-day saints and worked at a pizza par- parlor he struggled 
but he was trying his best. Then on September 16th, 1989, Stephen was hit by a drunk driver while he was on his motorcycle on his way home after work. It was a hit and run, though the driver was later arrested. Stephen was killed. 14-year-old Timothy White was the pallbearer at his funeral. That's so sad. 14 years old. Timothy would also have a tragically short life. He died April 1st, 2010, of a pulmonary embolism. Baby. I just hate this fucking case. <sighs> Before his death, Stephen worked with the FBI to help them with profiling sexual predators and pedophiles. He spoke at schools about stranger danger. I Know My Name Is Stephen is a pretty, I can't say good movie, but it's accurate. It's triggering as fuck. But if you can handle it, I do suggest watching it. Ultimately, Stephen was a hero though his older brother, Carrie, would later accuse him of molesting his own children. There's a good reason why we take that with a grain of salt the size of the fucking moon. Yeah. Now, I'm only going to gloss over this last bit. It's a totally separate case. I will be covering it on Patreon this week. So if you want to hear about it, you can pop over there and subscribe. Following Stephen's tragic death in 1989, Carrie's uncle would also die that year with all the media attention, the kidnapping, the emotional withdrawal of his parents and the deaths. Carrie struggled. In a weird twist of fate, Carrie went on to be a handyman at a resort in Yosemite National Park. There, between 1997 and 1999, Carrie would murder two women and two teenage girls. He left a map for police to find one of his victims, and this helped lead to his arrest. During his conviction, Carey said that he fantasized about murdering women when he was seven years old, four years before the kidnapping of Stephen. He was sentenced to death and awaits execution. His case is infinitely more complicated than that, y'all. But like I said, I don't have time to do it justice in this episode. It'd be like four hours long. Right. Um, and if you want to hear me do a full episode on it, it will it will be released late Sunday evening, early Monday morning on Patreon. I've already started my notes and I'm reading a book on it. And it's rough, y'all. He accuses his father, too, of molesting his sisters. Um, he said that his mother was molested by her father. And I do want to say, I do think there's some truth to what he says but not a lot do you think he's just taking it's like it's almost like um he like he saw so much of this going on and this got his brother attention even though it was negative attention it was still I think attention. that's part of it i think it's just like trigger words and like attention seeking trigger words i think he was very angry with his parents yeah and i think he said those things to hurt them absolutely but i do think the family was dysfunctional and might have been before the kidnapping remember predators just have a fucking sense don't they about yeah. you know how many times i've been preyed upon because i give off big victim Girl, energy. i feel like like you know when when you get bit by a, a brown recluse and then all of a sudden you start getting bit by brown recluses all the time Actually, yes, that did happen. To, I'm so I've been bitten by so many brown recluse spiders. I'm immune. Ugh, knock on wood, but like I haven't. But I've seen people do that. And I they have a say, scar on my. They chest. say there's like a pheromone or something that they can smell. One time, Maris was doing some gardening, and he was bitten seven times by a brown recluse. Jesus Christ! It never necrosed or anything. It was just itchy, but still it's scary. I've seen it necrose, but that's what it feels like. Almost, you know, it's like, yeah. like they're, they can sniff aside it on from me. the years that I was pregnant and nursing. I was assaulted at least once every year from the age of 13 to mid twenties into my marriage yeah. and everything. And started it like at five and a half thing, five, five and a half, six for me is when it started. And it just didn't stop until right. I got with Maris. Right. I feel he I don't definitely protects me. I don't want to need to be protected. Right. Like I said, y'all, I'm impossible to fucking kidnap. Yeah. I'll just put all like Earth's gravity in my ass and sit down. You don't have to drag me. I don't know how you're going to do it. You ain't that strong. I eat a lot of fried chicken. But, you know, know, I'm going to be covering a case probably on Patreon. Or, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But there was a woman that was pregnant. And abducted. Yeah. That's just scary. With twins. So scary. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I don't know, but I'm just so mad. Like, I hit that word in the wiki article towards the, like, I was just polishing up, like, finishing up my notes. And I hit that and I had to include it because that is a prevailing idea that 
they act like they're sparing us from the stigma and then not punishing our our abusers. Right. Well, and it's like uh, most of the time you'll see it the other way. Like, um, oh, was that Kyle kid? Um, Rittenhouse? No, the the one that molested or that, oh, that sexually sorry. assaulted. Um, I'm just calling him Kyle. I don't know his name. I think his name's Kyle. Blonde hair, blue eyes. He's oh, in that Florida. guy. Um, yeah. He's out now and was seen at like, like bars and party spots and stuff like Jesus. that. But, um, yeah, it's like they, they get... Oh, they don't want him to have the stigma. He was just a young guy. That's not that's not the law. No. I'm sorry. Are we are we talking about, you know, just social family vibes and shit? Or are we like actually talking about the law? Like, is this a criminal court case? Or is this just Ugh. a luncheon at a church that we're just gonna talk shit on anybody that's not in the room? My blood pressure. Yeah, I'm I think his name you. was Kyle. But like, mm, I don't know, y'all. I just This isn't this isn't law. This isn't court. like it's just the stigma should be on the perpetrator alone. Uh, they shouldn't be able to ever show their face again yeah. for doing this to children or women or any fucking one. Men you get raped too. If you can't keep your hands to yourself, you don't do get to have hands. The end. <laughs> All that, but you don't deserve to <laughs> be able to touch anyone. You don't deserve to be in arms reach. Hard to do anyone. without hands. I hear. I'm just real pissed off. I know. I want to rip off. I'm full too. Hammurabi's not, code. Not cut. Rip. <laughs> I am. I'm just invoking Hammurabi's code on this one. I'm like, eye for an eye, motherfucker. Them hands got to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm just going to, I'll throw hands. I'll chop them off and throw them. Now it's, they're gone. You don't get to have them. I joke. Kind of. Not really. I, I'm really. Boy, don't. I'm very black and white like about pedophiles. it. If you, if you touch another person inappropriately, you don't get to anymore Mm -mm. that's it yeah and if non-violent offenders that's not an offense go back out there like what the fuck if it's not violent then you shouldn't be in jail yeah it was jail is to protect me from people who want to hurt me yes it's i don't like that it's a punishment i want to feel like jail is there to protect me yes i don't need them punished i want them to go away pay their way out no or yeah. else if there's a crime yeah. you commit and the of uh, like if you can get out of it by paying a fine then it is direct attack against the working class and that's you friends i don't know if there are any rich folks listening to this you need to cut me a check <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think so. I think yeah. we're all in this together, y'all. Yeah. I think we're all ha- struggling. Inflation is ridiculous. Recession is dumb. Mm-hmm. Uh, world fire. World poop. It's mm-hmm. just bad. So I want to try and end this on a nice note. How are you going to do that? Well, Willow, I'm not entirely sure, <laughs> but I'm trying. Bro, I've been disassociating <laughs> for like two weeks. Just yeah. like <laughs> I made a bunch I... of edibles, and that has certainly helped. That, that does help. Yeah, I use it for my epilepsy, but sometimes you take a little more because you want to go night night. Because this is bad. But a bad place. Mm, I've been making a lot of art, and I've been making a lot of soap. And uh, my middle child, Valentine, well, not a child now, is an adult, is 18, has taken up the soap business with me. And together we make soap. And soon we'll have it up where you can buy it. And it's delicious. And that makes me happy because I love making soap. Why? I like being clean. It's good. good. Yeah. Oh, of course, a Virgo with like heavy Virgo and Capricorn in her chart is going to have soap business. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Clean it up, bitches. (laughs) Yeah, and then my theme for this collection, yes, I do collections where I release like four or five soaps. Right. This one is themed like just evil bitch soap. That's what I'm Ooh, calling it. I like so we have that. succubus, yeah. which is a nice uh, kind of deep floral with like a lot of jasmine. Mm. We have vampire queen, which is like floral and apple. It's really interesting and yummy. Mm. And then I have like this rose and odd wood, which is a very good combination. You guys odd are going to like it. What I've done here. Odd wood. Odd wood. It's a very fragrant wood, like sandalwood. Okay. And it's, but it's more powdery, kind of incense It's very nice. Mm. It combines beautifully with rose. So I'm obsessed with rose. I love and rose. it's like a nice English rose fragrance, too. Mm. So that nice woodsy smell anchoring mm. the lightness and the sweetness, kind of almost honey scent of the rose. Well, it's nice. You y'all. did good. You did, I did good, good changing the subject. Yeah. yeah. I that, like talking about that smells. Made my brain feel a lot better. Then it's like yeah. pretty smell. Yeah. So pet, pet the brain. <laughs> I'll have bath bombs, uh, yes. candles and perfume yes. oil, too. So not right now. 
but just prepare yourself for yeah. it. Like get ready. Be like, maybe I'll save this $5 yeah. and buy some soap. Mm -hmm. And Valentine made strawberry boba tea soap. They're so cute. They're so they cute. They look like boba tea. And they smell like boba tea. Mm -hmm. Like cute. it's just milky, strawberry, creamy. It's so good. Anyway, I've babbled enough about soap. Uh, the link tree in our description is where you can find our Patreon, our coffee account, uh, art, photography, all kinds of nonsense is on there. You just go look at it. You click around. Also, our Discord, never behind a paywall. Come discuss cases, suggest cases, show me your dog, what you made for dinner. I don't give a shit. Y'all, we need memes is the thing. Memes give me your hot, the fresh one memes. Thing that get me fresh hot dopamine straight to the brain it's a, when i lacking. see the little notification and i go in there and it's in memes it's a, memes. It's a serotonin thank you thank That's you for it. that mm -hmm. i need the serotonin we're deplete there's not a lot it's dry and dusty in there unmedicated we're raw dogging this shit and it's yeah. hard so y'all they're out of adhd medication i'm just insane now <laughs> I'm just, my brain's just like 40 ping pong matches in 50 different countries all at the same time. I'm struggling. My visibility on Instagram and Facebook is just not there at all. Like my friends don't ever. I don't see, see my, your no, posts. No. So ever. It feels very lonely. So come into the discord and be yeah. friends. It is nice. Is parasocial relationships toxic? Not this time. No, just be my friend. I'm sad, <laughs> and we'll be your friend back, and it'll be fun. It's not weird. And if you've if it's you've never weird. been in Discord, I never had until this podcast. We're all fresh. We all don't know what the nobody fuck. knows we, what the fuck really they're doing, don't. and and we don't progress from that either. So come join us. We don't know what's going on. And if you're like, hey, Lillian, um, I'd love to, but I don't know how. You can literally message me, and I'll yeah. tell you. Yeah. We are not famous. Yeah, you can message For, me. Yeah. I'm a trash bag yeah. person. I'm a cockroach. Cockroach. I survive, but at what cost? And you will message yeah. me and I will help you. Mm -hmm. I don't ignore any message unless it's like me love booby remove cloth. And then I'm yeah. just, you Bob. know, no, thank you. No, Chuck. Come through. <laughs> Honker donkers. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so click on that. Also, case photos, notes, show notes, which includes sources. I got tired of putting them in the notes uh, of like the description because then who reads that? No one. So if you want to see sources or like, oh, I want to watch that documentary Lillian talked about. Go to our Patreon. Those are all public posts. Yeah. Where I didn't take the fucking photos. Why would I put them behind a right. paywall? That's right. a ding dong behavior. So you're ding free dong. to ding dong to go look at that and uh yeah that's about all i got unless you got anything no i just really love and appreciate y'all oh yes like y'all we're we're worldwide and y'all are in countries i've never heard of and i couldn't oh, find that's on the map. cool and you know that just really makes me blush that's our arkansas education at work yeah what's going on where are we i don't, I don't know, know. It's pretty outside, I'll tell you that. But that's about it. That's about what I know. Mm -hmm. I could tell you what different kind of birds there is. Because oh, yeah. I like bird watching. Yeah. I like how the crows yell at each other. It's, it's so cute. Yeah. Uh, we dump all of our food waste. Yes. Off the back yes. of our deck. Yeah, the crows love it. And they like come out every morning and scream at it. <laughs> it's very funny. And anyway, if all you can guys can do to support the podcast is listen, we'll... Golly, we sure thank you for it. It means really the world to day. me. It does yeah. make my day. When I see the little numbers go up, I'm like, oh, serotonins. Thank Desperately you for needed. listening. It yes, really does you. melt our hearts. We do it for you. Yeah. For real. Because, like, I don't think I'd do this, like, in my room by my... Ooh, I might, might talk to myself. I don't know. But anyway, we love you guys, and thank you. <laughs> Find us on your social media platform of choice. Linktree slash cruelty has all of the links. Check out our Patreon for exclusive episodes, merch, ad-free episodes, live ghost hunts, and much more. Please be sure to subscribe. New episodes are uploaded weekly. Thank you so much. See you next time. Music and production by Willie Beaton.